But tonight we're, we're walking through this book. Um, as I've said before, this is one of the most foundational books in my own walk with the Lord. Uh, nothing in this study is going to be profound and new, more than likely. Uh, but it is great to remind us important things about the Christian faith. This is not everything a Christian should know, but it is things that every Christian should know and should live out and believe. Uh, so as we walk through this tonight, uh, the first chapter that as we see here is every Christian ought to know that the Bible is the Word of God. And again, that's not profound, right? That's, that's one of those duh statements that every Christian ought to know the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, but it's increasingly more likely that new believers do not know that truth. Um, and not just new believers, but uh, there's this whole push uh, in different groups of Christianity, um, specifically liberal Christianity. And when I say liberal, I'm not talking about political. I'm talking about theologically. Um, but in liberal theological circles uh, that would even say that the Bible is not inerrant that there are issues in Scripture. There are uh, places that it contradicts itself, and, and we don't believe that. We, we do affirm there are difficulties in Scripture, sure. There are things that are hard for us to understand. Rightfully so, if a God that is above our understanding wrote this, there's going to be some areas that are hard for us to piece together, right? But that does not mean that it's incorrect or that it in any way co in, co contradicts itself. And so as we get into it, kind of the, the theme passage for this understanding is found, as you see in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. This is the foundation for what we believe about Scripture, that every single word found in God's Word as it says here, is inspired. Literally, when you get back to the original Greek, it is God's breath. It is his breath written down on paper. And uh, as we go through in, in our understanding of how we receive the scriptures, we see that God inspired mankind. God inspired men, imperfect sinners. He inspired them to write, and they wrote beautifully and perfectly God's intended will for mankind. We also see their individual personalities come out in the writings. We see personal requests that are made known in the writings. Uh, but in every piece of the 66 books that we have in our canon of Scripture, they are perfectly inspired. Now, one important thing to note when we talk about this passage, what Paul is referring to is the Old Testament. When Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, the New Testament did not exist yet. And so what Paul is talking about that's inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work, the Old Testament is sufficient in that. If we had nothing but the Old Testament, we have everything we need for salvation. We have everything we need for holiness, for, as it says here, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So even though the Old Testament is sufficient, God went above and beyond and still gave us the New Testament. And now with that understanding, this also applies to our New Testament text. That mankind did not decide which books were inspired and which ones were not. In the same way that the, the, that the Lord inspired the authors, he also inspired those that collected the books together and put them into our scriptures that we know and love. And so this is the foundation that every word in the scripture is inspired by God and it is for our benefit so that we can be complete and equipped for every good work. Um, even going back what we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that the Christ did not come to abolish any of the scriptures, but he came to fulfill them, to fulfill the law and the prophets. What was written in the early days in the Old Testament has perfectly been fulfilled in Christ. Uh, and so we work under this, this understanding and as you see here, uh, Dr. Rogers goes through, he gives this, this interesting analogy of sitting on a plane saying there's only three problems uh, for any man. He's, he, he says he's sitting on an airplane, uh, there's a, a lawyer sitting there, and they're talking through, and he, he says uh, to the lawyer, man has three problems, sin, sorrow, and death. And the guy says, no, there's more problems than that. He said, all right, think about it and tell me a fourth problem. He says he thought about it, and then he said, man only has three problems. 
And then Adrian Rogers goes on and says, Every other problem in the world is indeed just a subset of sin, sorrow, death, and the Bible is the only book on earth that has the answer to all three conditions. For this reason, it is important that you understand and have a rock-ribbed assurance that the Bible is the Word of God. That is so foundational for us to remember. Anything that we come across in life can be spoken to from God's Word. Now, that does not mean that it's going to explicitly describe every situation that we go through, but it can apply to every situation. Uh, and so that's very important for us to understand. Uh, he goes on and talks about the war against Scripture, uh, even more so than when this was written. Uh, this was, I think the original version came out in the late 80s, early 90s, maybe, I don't remember. Um, it was based off his new members class, but uh, even from the time that this was originally written to today, that war against God's Word is even more so, especially in our nation. Now, it's, it's always been that way around the world, but especially in our culture, in our context, there is a war against Christianity, against God and His Word, and so it's important for us to make sure uh, that we understand this is our authority, this is our foundation. Uh, so we get into the, the, the points for tonight. The first one you see there, the Bible is shown to be the Word of God because of its scientific accuracy. Uh, because of its scientific accuracy. As he walks through this, uh, he, he walks through several different concepts that have been popular uh, throughout history, uh, scientific truths and realities that were established that said this is exactly how it is. When later on down the road it was found those things to not be true, yet the Word of God has been true the whole time. Uh, so for one of those, one example of that is that the earth is suspended in space. Uh, he goes on to talk about the, the understanding of how the, the earth is situated and what its foundation is. Uh, he says ancient cultures didn't always know that the earth was suspended in space. The ancient Egyptians used to believe the earth was supported by pillars. The Greeks believed that the world was carried on the back of a giant whose name was Atlas. And the Hindus believed something even more ridiculous, that the earth was resting on the backs of giant elephants. Then somebody said, but wait a minute, what are the elephants standing on? The answer was the elephants are standing on the back of a huge tortoise, a giant turtle. And somebody said, well, what's the turtle resting on? And the answer was, well, that turtle's on the back of a huge coiled serpent. And somebody said, well, what's the serpent on? And the conclusion was that the serpent was swimming in a great cosmic sea. And this was considered the science of the day. And through all of that, in Job chapter 26, verse 7, which, by the way, Job is the oldest book in our scriptures. It was the first written book. Now, I know Genesis is at the beginning of the Bible, but historians have dated Job to be thousands of years before Genesis was written. Uh, Moses is the one that wrote the first five books of the Bible, and Moses wasn't around until long into Israelite history. Job is, is the oldest book in our scripture and is considered one of the oldest books in history uh, as far as complete works go. Job is an incredibly old book. And in Job chapter 26, verse 7, it says, He stretches out the north over the empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. So even Job, which is the oldest book in our scripture, clearly says that the earth hangs on nothing, that it is suspended in space. Uh, and he even goes on to say it's perhaps the oldest piece of literature known to man. And how did he know that? Well, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Job inspired, or Job was inspired by God to write about the earth hanging in nothing because of the power of the Lord. Uh, second thing, and this is one that uh, as a child I thought we had kind of put to bed, but now I'm realizing that people are as dumb as ever and uh, they still believe the earth is flat. So... Uh, the earth is round, it is not flat, uh, despite what these flat earthers say and uh, all the evidence that proves otherwise, they still think the earth is flat. Uh, and that was common back in, in years, years ago. Uh, even in 1492 with Columbus sailing, there was the fear, the, the common story is the fear is that he would sail off the edge of the earth. Uh, that was common among sailors. They were afraid to go certain directions because they just didn't know what was there. Uh, but even before that was written, matter of fact, 750 years before Christ was born, um, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 22 says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And the circle, the word in Hebrew, I'm not going to try to pronounce it because it's C-H-U-W-G. Go for it if you want to. 
Uh, but the word in Hebrew actually means globe or sphere. So when, when Isaiah said uh, that the Lord sits above the circle of the earth, the actual word was a globe or a sphere. So he understood that it was a three-dimensional circle, not just a flat circle that's resting with some kind of dome over it, but that it's actually a sphere. Uh, again, how did he know that? Because of what we see in Scripture, the Lord has instructed and has inspired every word in his Scriptures. Another thing that we see, uh, a common teaching of the day, is that the stars cannot be counted. Uh, it's interesting that he, he talks about this story. 150 years before Christ, Hipparchus, uh, who was an astronomer and scientist during his day, very popular, said that he had counted every star in the sky, and he said that there were 1,022 stars in the sky. He had counted every single one of them. I don't know how you could even... Where's your stopping point? You're not counting to 1,022 all at once. Like you got to take a break. And how do you know which one you stopped on? You know, so he's charting this out, but he had nailed it down. It was 1,022 stars in the sky. And for 250 years, nobody questioned that. They said that was accurate science. But then Ptolemy came. He began to count the stars, and he says, oh, no, 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 Hipparchus was incorrect. There are actually 1,056 stars. So there were 34 stars that Hipparchus missed. And now Ptolemy made sure. Well, 1,300 years later, Galileo invented the first telescope, and he could see past the first layer of the stars, and he said uh, there are way more than that. There are hundreds and thousands and millions and billions of stars that we could never count how many there actually are because even when we can count the ones we see, we can get a telescope to see further. And now with the advancements of the Hubble telescope and, and the incredible science that we have available to us, it is absolutely impossible to count how many stars there actually are because there's galaxies beyond what we can even see currently. So that number is always going to continue to grow. Well, as the, sun, I mean, as the science has caught up, uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, 33, 22 says that the host of heaven cannot be numbered uh, in Scripture. And that is referring to, uh, there's a dual meaning there, talking about the stars, but also talking about uh, the hosts of heaven, those that are there in the presence of God. Uh, a lot of times we see that dual meaning in Scripture, but saying that there are way more than 1,022 stars in the sky. Uh, but science of the day said that was true, and it was not argued because who are you to argue the science of the day, right? But God's Word made it clear, and it has been proven true as science has caught up to the truth. A third, third area we see this is that the blood circulates throughout the body. How many of you have heard the story about George Washington, how he actually died? Right? He was sick, and the way that they thought that they would cure his sickness was to bleed him. They put leeches on him, they would cut his skin open and let the blood run out. They thought he had bad blood, so if we get the bad blood out, he'll be fine. Exactly, exactly. And so they would bleed him, and ultimately the doctors bled George Washington to death. That's how he died, because they thought if we get the bad blood out of this area of his body, he'll be fine. Well, uh, it wasn't until 1628 that William Harvey discovered that the blood circulates throughout the body, um, that he goes on uh, to say in Leviticus chapter 17, 14, for it, it's talking about blood, it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains life. Had he been given a transfusion of good blood that could counteract and, and defeat whatever was going on in that blood, it would have been fine. But they didn't even understand then that the blood needed to be replenished, that it circulates throughout the body. You can't just drain one section of blood, that your heart is pumping it throughout your entire body. But even in God's Word... Uh, hundreds, well, thousands of years uh, before Christ came, that truth was known. I'm not going to go through this, but there's some interesting uh, medical facts from history in here, and I'd encourage you to go back and read through this on page 13 uh, about how to get splinters out and uh, if you eat, a, if you, what is it, if you uh, prevent your hair from turning gray, you anoint your hair with the blood of a black cat that's been boiled in oil with the fat of a rattlesnake. So, Funny things like that that were considered not just, you know, we got old wives' tales that talk about how to fix things now, but this was medical science of the day. And he doesn't mention it here, but uh, there was another book that I had read um, that talked about in ancient Egypt, um, 
feminine hygiene products, they would actually use crocodile dung soaked in honey as feminine hygiene products. That that was the medical standard of the day, right? So you can obviously see how there's a lot of issues with that, but that was science of the day. Uh, and so science catches up. Um, and, and so to that, I would say, um, when we see things, we're seeing it all over the place right now, follow the science, right? The science says this. And, and, and many times believers are afraid to discuss science with people because we don't understand science. We don't think, for example, in Hipparchus' day, would we have argued saying, of course there's more than 1,022 stars? Well, no, because one, we're not going to sit there and count the stars. And two, we had no way of seeing past those stars. So a lot of times we feel inadequate to have these conversations. Uh, so, for example, in the evolution debate, for example, when people say, uh, if you don't believe in evolution, you're stupid, how could you not believe that? Well, sometimes that it intimidates us because they have all these facts and they have all this evidence. Well, the reality is we have the same evidence. When we talk about the scientific method, observation is one of the key facets of the scientific method. Well, how did they observe evolution? Right? So they're, they're working with a flawed view of the scientific method by putting this scientific premise out there. We have the same evidence. We're all observing the same thing from the same perspective. The question is, are we going to allow science to catch up to what Scripture says, as we've already seen multiple times? Um, and the last thing that it talks about here is, is the Black Plague. Uh, during the Middle Ages, when the Black Plague was coming out, they had no way to fight it. There was no cure for it. There was no way to stop it from wreaking havoc throughout the known world. And it wasn't until the medical doctors of the day consulted with the scriptures in Leviticus 13. It's actually talking about leprosy and how to prevent the spread of leprosy among the Jewish people. And the answer was quarantine. In Leviticus 13, 46, it says, All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. The only way to prevent the spread of leprosy in that day was to separate yourself, to not give it to somebody else. And ultimately, that's how the Black Plague was defeated, by quarantining those that were sick and getting them away from the rest of the population. And so even in the Scriptures, there was the, the answer to a scientific problem of the day. Now, one thing to note, the Bible is not a science book. It was not written to give us scientific information. But it does show truth, and science does back it up when the science catches up. All right? So it's important to understand, we do not use the Bible as a science textbook, and it was not written, nor was it intended to be a science textbook. So we don't use it that way, but we do look to where, science has, or where Scripture has spoken about science, and we do see that it is scientifically accurate. Okay? So it's an important thing for us to, to understand here. The second main point for tonight is that the Bible is shown to be the Word of God because of its historical accuracy. It is historically accurate. And, and Dr. Rogers even says that. The Bible is not primarily a science book. It's not real, written to tell us how the heavens go. It is written to tell us how to go to heaven. That's one of the things I love about Dr. Rogers, his little, little one-liners, his little uh, things that he says that they're, if I'm honest, they're a little cheesy. But that's what I love about them. They're, they're cheesy enough to get your attention and you remember them, right? Um, but the same way, it's not primarily a history book. Uh, but it does tell the story of God, and it is historically accurate. Now, this is what's interesting. Uh, the historical records that we find in Scripture are often disputed. And they'll say, well, that's not true. And the example he gives here, um, somebody in the late 1800s, Dr. S.R. Driver, ridiculed the idea that Moses wrote what is called the Pentateuch, which Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Driver claimed, in the time that Moses was supposed to have lived on the earth, men didn't know how to write. So how could he have written the Pentateuch? So his argument in the 1800s was, people in ancient Egypt in the time that Moses lived could not write. So how could Moses have written the Pentateuch? Well, people kept going on until uh, they found in northern Egypt uh, some clay tablets. She was out working in her garden and found some clay tablets. And they were used to write back and forth. They were written from people in Egypt to people in Palestine uh, centuries before Moses was born. So it showed that there was written language before Moses was born, which would imply that Moses, especially if he was raised in Pharaoh's house, would have had access to the education to know how to write, and that he, therefore, could have written the first five books of the Bible. 
Now, in the current context, no one disputes the authenticity or the authorship of the first five books of the Bible. Even secular scholars affirm that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So this is no longer a real argument. But it does give you the idea that people are always trying to contradict what Scripture says. Another example he gives here uh, is in the book of Daniel, the story uh, of the, the handwriting on the wall. King Belshazzar saw handwriting on the wall during a feast he made for thousands of, thousands of his lords and ladies. The gruesome handwriting told him that he was weighed in the balances and found wanting. Um, scholars have laughed and said it's a fabrication because the, the records that we have of the ancient Babylonians, we know that Belshazzar was not the last king of Babylon. The last king of Babylon was named Nabonidus. Obviously, this would appear to be just some pious fraud, some story that somebody made up. So they said because historically, uh, Belshazzar was not the last king, that the book of Daniel is inaccurate, therefore it cannot be trusted, that Nabonidus was. Well, uh, archaeologists uncovered a cylinder, and on it was the name Belshazzar. More records were found that showed the historians were right when they said that Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon, but they were wrong when they said that Belshazzar was not. Nabonidus and Belshazzar were father and son, and they ruled together as the last kings of Babylon. So just because, this is, this is one of those things where we want to make sure, the Bible is not a history book. It is not written to tell you the history of Babylon and who the last king was. But when it makes the statement that Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon, it is an accurate statement, right? So where we would expect the history book to tell us Belshazzar and Nabonidus, father and son, ruled together. They were the last kings. The Bible does not do that, but that doesn't mean it's inaccurate because it doesn't include Nabonidus in that. Belshazzar was the last king, and he was, and it is accurate based on what the Scripture says. So the Bible is uh, the Word of God because it is historically accurate. While it's not a history textbook, uh, the accounts it gives of history are accurate and can be trusted. All right? This is probably my favorite thing to look at in all of this is the unity throughout the Scripture. Uh, the Bible is shown to be the Word of God because of its wonderful unity. I love the analogy that he uses here. Uh, it, I've heard this, bef this part before, but it's, it's one book uh, that's made up of 66 books. There's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, written by at least 40 authors, and there's possibly more lived over a period of 1,600 years in 13 different countries and on three different continents. And yet from Genesis to Revelation, it tells one story. Now, uh, he says the Bible has one theme, and you've got these if you want to fill in the blanks there. The one theme of the Bible is redemption. The one hero is the Lord Jesus. The one villain is the devil. And the one purpose is the glory of God. Everything fits together. Now, he gives an analogy here that this is, this is what I absolutely love. And I'd encourage you to, to go back and read through this. It starts on page 18. He says, Dr. R.A. Torrey gave this illustration. Uh, Suppose in your city they decided to build a monument honoring all of the 50 states in the Union. Stones are gathered from each state. For example, from my home state of Florida, they get coral stone. From Georgia, they would get granite. From Indiana, they get limestone. From Nevada, sandstone. All the various kinds of stones in different colors. Then let's suppose that these stones are cut into different shapes. Some are square, some are rectangular, some are cylindrical, some have a pyramid shape, some are like a trapezoid, and some have shapes that don't even have a name. They're cut out in the quarry, put in crates, shipped by barge, by rail, and by air to your city. Workmen uncrate these stones and begin to put them together, and they all interface, they all interlock. There is not one stone too many, not one stone too few. No stone needs to be built up, no stone needs to be shaved down, and when they're finished, it's a magnificent temple. Now, you're a thinking person. Would you say that that happened by chance? No. Any thinking person would say that it did not happen by chance. There would have had to have been a master architect who, in his mind, could see that building, could see that building and had set out the specifications to the quarry. Is that not true? You see, when we get this book written over a period of 1,600 years, 40 different authors, three different languages, by men from all different walks of life and bring it together, it makes one beautiful temple of God's truth. Nothing needs to be added or taken away or embellished. There it stands, one book. We can't say that just happened, that it was just an accident. No, the unity of the Bible is one of the wonderful proofs of the inspiration of God's Word that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. What a beautiful analogy to help describe this. And, and on, a, on a different scale of looking at the, the wonderful unity of Scripture, 
one of the most foundational things whenever I was teaching middle school students and, and even when I was a student pastor in general, one of the most foundational things that I tried to teach students was the idea of the grand narrative of Scripture, that the 66 books are telling one story. From Genesis to Revelation, there is one story that the Lord is telling. And the whole book, the whole 66 books of Scripture are written to tell us how God is reconciling the world to himself through his son Jesus. That is the story of the Bible. And from Genesis to Revelation, we see how all of that works together beautifully and perfectly. And what that does, when you begin to read the Bible in that context, you begin, you begin to see how the context determines the rest of it. That as things are written in Genesis, it's setting up what we see in the New Testament, for example, uh, which is going to bring us uh, to the next statement here, that the Bible must be the Word of God because of its fulfilled prophecy. That what was foretold in the Old Testament has been fulfilled in the New, that Christ has perfectly fulfilled it. And one of the biggest... Uh, contradictions to prophecy is that Jesus set it up. That because he was a Jew and because he had been trained from the time that he was a small child uh, till his adulthood life, that he knew the Old Testament scriptures and that he somehow manipulated it to fit so that he could fulfill the prophecy. Well, to that I say, you're absolutely right because he's God. <laughs> he wrote it down in the beginning. He's the one that fulfilled it through himself. But when we look at it from the human perspective, that, that Jesus as a man could not have fulfilled these things. And some of the things that he points out was uh, if, if he did arrange all this to happen, he had to arrange where he would be born. Now, how is it possible for a man to arrange where he would be born before he's born? Right? It's not possible. But in Micah chapter 5, uh, verse 2, we see the, the uh, prophecy that he would be born in Beth Bethlehem Ephrathah. Uh, by the way, the, word, the name Bethlehem, the name of our church, means the house of bread. Uh, isn't it interesting that uh, the bread of life was born in a town called the house of bread? Uh, neat little side note there. But uh, hundreds of years before he was born, uh, fulfilled there in Matthew chapter 2, uh, that he would be born. Um, also, the, the crucifixion. Now, this is interesting, and I've got it there on your paper. Uh, Psalm 22 if you've never read that psalm, I mean, it is as if David is standing at the foot of the cross watching what's happening and listening to the words of Jesus as he writes them down. Uh, even, even in the sense of him asking, crying out to God, God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, my bones are disjointed. They're out of wax. and uh, they're, 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 it's like they're pulled out of socket and I'm being poured out. I'm thirsty. The things that David writes down in Psalm 22 are eerily familiar to the, to the crucifixion account. Uh, but here's what's interesting. In Psalms 22, when he's talking about his hands and feet are pierced, David even gets so specific as to talk about the hands and feet of this man crying out being pierced. When David wrote Psalm 22, crucifixion did not exist. Uh, everybody thinks the Romans were the ones that started crucifixion, but they weren't. The Persians actually were the ones that created crucifixion. Uh, the Romans were the ones that made it famous. That was kind of the Roman form of execution, but they stole it from the Persians. So when David wrote about the hands and feet of Jesus being pierced, it didn't even exist yet. That, that's, in, that's crazy to think about, that the Holy Spirit inspired David to write about the hands and feet of the Son of Man being pierced on a tree, well, not on a tree specifically, but being pierced. And then, a few hundred years later, crucifixion was invented. It was perfected by the Romans and ultimately fulfilled by Christ on the cross. So, beautiful picture of Scripture being fulfilled, writing about it even before it came about. Uh, when you go on through, uh, this is just a, a few different ones, um, but what he says here in, in, on page 21, this one psalm, Psalm 22, contains 33 direct prophecies that were fulfilled at Calvary, yet written a thousand years before the birth of Christ. Isn't that crazy? 33 prophecies in that one chapter, and it was written a thousand years before Christ was even born. So incredible, incredible detail. Um, uh, the fact that he was crucified between two thieves, Isaiah 53 shows us that. Uh, Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. The exact number of pieces of silver was prophesied in Zechariah. 
Uh, you can go back and read through these passages on your own. I've put them there on the paper for you to, to have that. Um, and then I, I didn't put this on the list because I didn't know how to word it exactly, but uh, the fact that he appeared to 500 after he, was, after he rose from the dead, um, that he fulfilled the prophecy of, of coming back uh, all this was done, Matthew 26, 56, all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Uh, 500 witnesses saw him after he rose from the dead. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different theories, even on Jesus dying, that, that he didn't actually die, that the people that saw him afterwards, uh, he just recovered. Uh, one of the most insane ones was the, it's called the swoon theory, uh, that they believe that Jesus did go to the cross, that uh, he was beaten to within an inch of his life and was very badly injured. Uh, but they put him in the tomb before he was actually dead, that he just passed out on the cross. And that he uh, came out of the tomb three days later, but he never actually died. Well, if that were true, that is an incredibly miraculous recovery for him to be walking around after he was suffocated on the cross. And by the way, if you don't know that, that's how you die on the cross. You can't breathe, so you essentially you suffocate. Um, some scholars have looked at Jesus' specific form of crucifixion with the beating that he took ahead of time and everything that he went through. And uh, medically, they have said Jesus may not have suffocated because he died much sooner than the rest of them. If you actually see in the scriptures, uh, they broke the legs of the thieves. Uh, they would break their legs so they can't hold themselves up and they suffocate and die quicker. Um, one of the prophecies was that his bones would not be broken, so he had already died before that point. Um, but <coughs> um, even in that, uh, the doctors have said one of the ways that he may have died was that his body just shut down because of the overwhelming pain that he had, that his brain essentially told his heart to stop beating so that the pain would stop. Uh, so how he died, we don't know. Honestly, that's irrelevant, uh, but we do know that he did suffer that he did die on the cross, uh, that he didn't just pass out and then wake up three days later and walk out. One of the theories is that uh, the disciples stole his body and then they had a double dress up that looked like Jesus after the fact going around telling people. Uh, one of the main things, too, is that everybody hallucinated that saw Jesus. Well, 500 people had the same hallucination at the same time. Whatever they were smoking must have been really good if that were to happen for them to all have the same hallucination. Uh, but... There again, fulfilled the scripture, fulfilled the prophecy, uh, and showed who he was. Some other things that are interesting that, that he doesn't explicitly get into, but even looking ahead to some of the prophecies that have still not been fulfilled yet. So, for example, when you read through some of the end time prophecies in Revelation that talks about the two witnesses that will stand in the streets of Jerusalem proclaiming uh, the, the gospel, that when those two men are killed in the streets of Jerusalem, it says that all of the world will see that happen. Well, if you think about that, in the time that John wrote that, about 90, the, the year 90, uh, when he wrote that, it would have been impossible for the entire world to have seen two men killed in the streets of Jerusalem. But what if that happened today? If two men who have garnered all this attention, they've got these big crowds following them, and they're murdered in the streets of Jerusalem, it will be available on everybody's phones instantly. The entire world will see that happen. So even things like that, where we see technology catching up with what the prophecy has said, now obviously God can miraculously and supernaturally do anything, but even just practically, how things are lining up to continue to affirm the scriptures and fulfill prophecies that we see. Um, it goes on, the Bible is shown to be the word of God because of its ever-living quality. Uh, the Bible is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, we see 1 Peter 1, 24-25, the word of the Lord endures forever. Uh, larger context of that passage is that uh, flesh is like grass and it will wither, it will fade away, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away, it endures forever. Um, God's promise to Isaiah 2,500 years ago, As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. That's Isaiah 59, 21. I saw a very interesting graph the other day, and, and I like graphs and statistics and, and reading those types of things. Uh, but it was talking about religions across the world. And 
when you look at the breakdown of the demographics of people that ascribe to certain religions. Uh, obviously, Hindus was very much in, overwhelmingly Indian, right? Uh, Muslim was overwhelmingly uh, Arabic people. Um, Judaism, obviously, overwhelmingly Jewish. Uh, so you, you see these different religions that are, are very specific to the demographics of the groups that they were started in. But Christianity, when you looked at the demographic breakdown of Christianity, it was the most diverse religion in the world and the most equally diverse. That The people groups around the world were equally represented for the most part as being Christianity. And so it's interesting to me as well that these different religions are very specifically geared towards the cultures that they were started in. Whereas Christianity is widely accepted uh, across the world by different people groups because, going back again to fulfilled prophecy, through Abraham's descendant, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Uh, not just a specific people group. All right. So uh, it is living and active. It, it is transcendent of culture. Uh, and the last thing that we're going to look at tonight is it is the Word of God because of its transforming power. Uh, this is where my heart is as a pastor. Uh, people have, have talked about the way that I preach, and, and my method of preaching is I don't have anything good enough or intriguing enough to talk about to keep your attention and to change your life. What I do have is the Word of God. The Word of God is the one thing that has the power to save. Romans 1.16 is one of the passages he references here. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The only thing able to save a sinner who is destined for hell is the love of God displayed through His Word, shown to us because it is an inspired Word of God, and He alone has shown us that. Um, in Jeremiah 23, 29, uh, my word is like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. His word shapes us. It transforms us. It, it makes us look more and more like him. And, and so for me, my heart as a pastor is I want to do two things. First of all, I want to love the Lord and his word, and I want to do that with everything that I have. I want to love God's word uh, because it describes who he is and it instructs me in my way of life. And I want to teach that well. And the second thing is I want to love his people. And his word is what instructs me in how to do that and how to do that effectively. Everything else, uh, it'll work itself out. Uh, but those are the two things that I focus on, following God's word and teaching it well and loving on his people. Uh, and I love what he says as he talks about Billy Graham uh, preaching. He said, Billy Graham always said, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. In, in my honest and humble opinion, that's the only way to preach. It doesn't matter what I say. My opinion is irrelevant. What I think about stuff doesn't matter. At the end of the day, God's word is what matters, and that's what that's that's how I want to preach. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Uh, but when he talks about what God's word is, God's word is saving for the sinner. Uh, it will stir the conscience, convict the mind, and convert the soul. It is sweet for the saint. So many times I've found treasure and peace in the word of God. Oh, how precious are the words of God. It is sufficient for the sufferer. How many times people have pillowed their head on the precious promises of the Word of God. I feel sorry for people who do not have a Bible to lean on. And it is satisfying to the scholar. I have studied this book and I would never even dream of saying I've come to the bottom of the Word of God. Someone said the Word of God is so deep that the scholars can swim and never touch bottom. And yet so precious that a little child can come and get a drink without fear of drowning. Thank God for the Bible, the Word of God. So tonight as we... As we look at this, every Christian ought to know that the Bible is the Word of God. That it is our authority, it is what we walk through, it is what leads us, it is what guides us, it is the only thing uh, that can save us. And so through the rest of this study, this is foundational. We said the same thing when we walked through the Baptist faith, the message, right? If we misunderstand that God's Word is our ultimate authority, then we misunderstand everything else. We have to have the authority set first, that God has given us his word. When we wonder, uh, everybody's always saying, I need the Lord to, to give me a sign. I need the Lord to, to reveal something to me. And my response to that is, well, open his Bible. <laughs> open your Bible and read it. He's already given it to you. You want the Lord to speak to you? He already has. Uh, we don't need a new revelation. We don't need all these new things that people are trying to say. 
we have God's word. It is sufficient, and it is our foundation for everything else that we do. Uh, so I want to encourage you to go home, read chapter 2. Every Christian ought to know the assurance of salvation. Uh, this is very important for us to understand. Uh, uh, I know as Southern Baptists we believe in the perseverance of the saints. That's one of the things, the key things that we affirm. Uh, but we're going to look specifically at the context of that. How do we understand that according to Scripture? And Dr. Rogers does a great job of helping explain that as well. So, uh, Any questions before we close out tonight? If you're watching online, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section. Uh, but any questions in the house tonight? All right. Well, let me pray for us, and then we will, uh, we will dismiss and get out of here. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for this time to come together and to, uh, to be encouraged by such a godly and faithful man uh, who lived his life according to your word, who led according to your word. And God, while this book is definitely not your word, it is definitely not the scripture, uh, God, it is such a, an incredibly helpful tool for us. And God, I pray that we would treat it as such. Uh, that God, we would be grateful uh, for the work that Dr. Rogers has put in and the, the example that he has left for us. And I pray that by his example, as we walk through this book together, we would be encouraged that our hunger and desire for you and for your word would only grow deeper. So God, we love you and we thank you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.